welcome to this episode. In the ancient world, the continent of Africa was known as the Land of the Gods. The Greek gods went to rest in Africa south of the Sahara, which they called Ethiopia, when they were not in Greece. According to British historian Godfrey Higgins, in his world-famous book, Anacalypsis, all the gods of the ancient world were black. In his words, we have found the black complexion or something related to it whenever we have approached the origin of nations. The alma mater, the goddess Multimamia, the founders of oracles, the memnons of first idols were always black. Venus, Juno, Jupiter, Apollo, Bacchus, Hercules, Astaroth, Adonis, Horus, Apis, Osiris, Ammon, in short, all the deities were black. The images remain as they were first made in very remote times. The ancients viewed the sacred image of the divine as black, and woolly hair was a sign of divinity called the hair of the gods. And Diodorus of Sicily, after visiting Ethiopia, i.e. Africa south of the Sahara, around 30 BCE, said, they further write that it was among them that people were first taught to honor the gods and offer sacrifices and arrange processions and festivals and perform other things by which people honor the divine. For this reason, their piety is famous among all men and the sacrifices among the Ethiopians are believed to be particularly pleasing to the divinity. Homer, in his famous work, The Iliad, wrote about the visit of the Greek god Zeus to Africa south of the Sahara, saying, Zeus went yesterday to ocean to a feast with the blameless Ethiopians and all the gods followed. There's no time to sit to the streams of ocean, to the lands of the Ethiopians, where they offer a hecatomb to the gods. I go once again so as to receive my share of the feast. So clearly there was a special relationship of some sort between Africans and the gods of antiquity. But when you visit Africa today, there's very little sign of that indigenous, ancient, prehistoric, cosmic relationship with divinity. That relationship was beaten and flogged out of them by Arab and European invaders who came bearing tales of new prophets, saviors and saints, with threats ranging from cosmic everlasting hellfire torture to public beheadings for non-adherents, all aimed at locking in the converted. The result being that today, over 90% of the continent of 1.2 billion people are either Christians or Muslims. So today, in the 2020s, and with the growing Pan-Africanism and resistance to imperialism across Africa, a new spirit is in the air, indicating, as some elders have suggested, a return of the African divinities. We believe that this is the right time to present to you this epic lecture by the legendary African-American historian and philosopher, Professor Mulefi Keje Ashante, which he presented at a seminar in Accra, Ghana, a decade or more ago. A lecture which, like aging wine, grows in potency, with each passing year. So here goes. I am pleased that you have come to hear my lecture tonight and I want to thank the organizers of this event for their diligence and generosity. I give praise to Nyame, Asaseya and the Nananom Nsamanfo for whatever clarity I'm able to share with you. I shall begin my lecture with a conclusion. Until an African leader publicly acknowledges, honors and prays to an African God we Africans will continue to be viewed as pathetic imitators of others, never having believed in ourselves. So powerful is the concept of religion when we discuss it in connection with civilization that to deny the validity of one's religion is to deny the validity of one's civilization. Indeed, to deny one's religion as valid is to suggest that the person is a pagan, a heathen, uncivilized and beyond the sphere of humanity. So to talk about religion is to talk about our views of ourselves, our understanding of our ancestors, and our love of our culture. To establish my argument that we have a crisis in civilization because we have a crisis in religion, I will make several points dealing with the themes of tradition, history, religion, and human action. Traditions. There are no people without traditions, and traditions are the lifeblood of a people. A people who refuse to express its love and appreciation for its ancestors will die because in traditions, if you are not expressing your own, you are participating in and expressing faith in someone else's ancestors. No person is devoid of an attachment to some cultural fountain. Whose water are we drinking? Our African history has been a recent escapade of forgetfulness. We have often lost our memories and accepted the gods of those who enslaved and colonized us. This is something the Chinese and the Indians have fought hard to keep at bay. While we have often embraced our enemies' gods, they have found those gods to be anathema to their interests. 
Show me the gods the Africans worship, and I will show the extent of our moral and ethical decay. Those who speak to us of Christian or Islamic morals have often been the very ones who have defiled our ancestors' memories and called our sacred rites paganism. Malcolm X once said that the world pushes the African around because we give the impression that we are chumps, not champs, but chumps, weaklings, falling over ourselves to follow other people rather than our own traditions. The distribution of religion represents the distribution of power. African distribution is minimal and exists in a few places in the diaspora like Brazil, Haiti, Jamaica, and the American South. The religion that people practice is based on the influences that have captured their imaginations. In the American South and the Caribbean and in South America, one will often find the Yoruba religion. It is Africa's most powerful religious export to the Americas, but this is still a minimal influence when one considers the fact that others have imposed their religions on us and we have accepted the imposition often without fight from our traditional leaders. Indeed, our traditional religious leaders have often been hijacked by the material goods offered by the purveyors of these migrating gods. History The great African pharaoh Nama united the two lands, bringing 42 clans or gnomes under one government around 3100 BC. By this time, already, Africans had formulated the first response to the unknown. If anything, we knew God before anyone else, not because we were wiser, but because we were first to be civilized. Until 7,000 years ago, all humans were black. Did they have an appreciation for the Almighty? Did they formulate a response to the unknown? Of course they did. They were human and human before anyone else. Our ancestors brought forth the first civilizations and gave the world the oldest organized cosmological explanations. Thus Ra, Espotar, Atom, Amen, Kepera, Knom, the many names of the One, the Supreme, created Shu and Tefnut, air and moisture, Geb and Nut, earth and sky. Then came Osa, Oset, Nebet and Set. Osa was killed by his brother Set and Oset put him back together with the assistance of her sister Nebet and her son Heru who avenged his father by killing Set. That is the story of good over evil. The purpose was to create Ma'at, balance, harmony, justice, righteousness, reciprocity, order. These are the key concepts in any ethical system, and the fact that they emerged first in the Nile Valley of Africa suggests that other ideas related to these ideas found their way into the very practices and beliefs of our people throughout the continent. The deliberate attempt by the Europeans to separate Africans from their classical civilizations of the Nile is one of the biggest falsifications in history. Only when we reclaim our history will we be able to see that the origins of many religious ideas are African. How is it that the parent has become the child? Thus, not only do we have the earliest emergence of God, we have the first ethical principles reinforced by proverbs and refined in the oral and artistic traditions of our narratives. The ancient name of Egypt was Kemet, and it was the culmination of classical Africa's achievements in science, art, architecture, medicine, astronomy, geometry, and religion. The Greeks honored the Africans as the originators of the science and art practiced by the Greeks themselves. It will be the Europeans of the 15th through 19th centuries that will try to divorce Egypt from its African origin and deny Africa any role in civilizing the world. The early Greek historian Herodotus claims that nearly all of the Greek gods came from Africa. We know that the Greeks worshipped Imhotep as Asclepius, the god of medicine, and that the name Athens, Athena, is from Athen. When Constantine in 325 AD took ideas from African spirituality and created a control mechanism at the Council of Nicaea, he was trying to organize a system for using African spiritual ideas. The early Christian church had to deal with the fact that Christians had used many African ideas, such as the Son of God, eternal life, and the resurrection in their religion. The sad fact is that since we have forgotten so much, we do not know that we are the originators of religion. The abandonment of our history, indeed, the abandonment of our gods, the gods of our ancestors, have brought us deep into the quagmire of misdirection, misorientation, and self-pity. When the missionaries forbade our shrines and punished us in the Americas, when we called the names of our gods and sounded our mighty drums, they were looking for the Pavlovian reaction they finally got in millions of Africans. 
African is bad, it is inferior, it is pagan, it is heathen. We often hear others cursing their ancestors in ways the Chinese, the Lebanese and the British will never allow. Why is this? Are we truly shamed by our military defeat? Can we no longer think about how right our ancestors were in exploring human nature and positing ways to combat the unknown? Cannot we create new forms out of the old mold, or must we throw away the mold? What will be any more pagan than a wanton, willful destruction of millions of Africans, Jews, Native Americans and Chinese by Christian Europeans? How could white men pray to a god on the second floor of a slave dungeon while on the first floor they held our ancestors, yours and mine, in horrible bondage? What kind of religion denied our humanity at the same time they were raping our women, brutalizing our children and demanding our wealth and our souls? It is true that the idea of Christian names or Muslim names promotes and advances those cultures. Why must you change your name even if you chose to buy into a foreign religion? What is wrong with your name? Any religion that asks you to do what others do not have to do is asking you to abandon your mother. The question is, why would you abandon your mother? Religion in general. What is religion but the deification of ancestors, the making sacred of traditions within the context and history? How can we honor any god who was used against us? The only people who accept alien gods are defeated people. All others honor and accept their own name for the Almighty. We must learn to appreciate ourselves and our traditions. What is wrong with the African god? What would we think of a Yoruba who accepted Chinese ancestors as his own? We will find it quite interesting and wonder how it came to be. But what of Africans' acceptance of others' gods? Is there no tradition with these alien gods? Of course there's a tradition with these gods. To accept the Jews' gods or the Arabs' gods or the Hindus' gods and so forth is to valorize those histories above your own. Indeed, it is to honor the names in those myths and stories higher than your own stories. It is to love the language, the places in their stories above your own. Why is Mecca, Rome or Jerusalem more sacred than Basumtwi? Quite simply, it is imperialism, not by force of arms, but by force of religion, which sometimes comes armed. Joel Kotkin's Tribes, a book about people ready for the 21st century, claims that only Jews, Chinese, Indians, Japanese and British are ready. These groups have some commonalities which include strong sense of identity, international network and a passion for technology. He does not include any African community or ethnic group. In fact, he believes that the African people were best organized under the leadership of Marcus Garvey, who believed that Africans were not only capable of achieving without the whites, Africans had to achieve without the white in order to be seen as fully participating in the drama of history. Kwame Nkrumah believes in much the same idea. Samuel Huntington's The Clash of Civilizations claims that there are six major civilizations, Chinese, Japanese, Orthodox, Hindu, Western and Islamic. He says each one has a nation that is a vanguard and deeply committed to its religion and history. Africa has no such vanguard nation and furthermore, Africa has yet to emerge from under the cloaks of its interventionists. Of 53 nations, only one nation is more African in religion than either Christian or Muslim, and that nation is small Benin Republic, next door to Nigeria. Benin is 87% popular traditional African religion, but it is a small nation with limited influence in a propaganda fashion. As such, we do not expect African traditional religion to play a major part in the civilization of Africa for some time to come but we can begin to examine the questions, to raise the issues and to interrogate our practices. Let me explore African religion with you to provide some common understanding. In the first place, it is important that we call popular traditional African religion everywhere by a common acronym, Ptari. This means that Akan, Yoruba, Igbo, Zulu and Shona are the same religion with different branches, just as Christians may be Baptist, Methodist and Catholics and just as Muslims may be Murids, Sunni or Shiites. There is no difference in speaking of Tare as one religion and speaking of Christianity or Islam as one religion. I believe that popular traditional African religion everywhere, Tare, is as old as civilization. Indeed, it is much older than either Christianity or Islam. The major characteristics of Tare are found in all of the traditions from east to west and from north to south. The fact that we have often misunderstood the legacy we have inherited is not the fault of those who left it. It is our fault 
for preferring the oppressor's legacy over that of our own ancestors. The characteristics of Tari include creator god, domicile of gods, presence, shrine, priest, priestess of god, devotee of god, medium, herbalist, pharmacist, psychiatrist, mental harmonizer, diviner, scientist, explorers, and hunters. All ritual in Ptare seeks a return to Matt. Everything is one. We are a part of the whole and nothing is disconnected from the Almighty. That is why we recognize Mother Earth as well as Nyame. What Europe sees and teaches as limitations in Ptare are really advantages. No vast interpretative literary corpus to say what is and what is not. Patari's interpretations are often dependent on a multitude of situations that demand attention. No concentration on the material manifestations of the God's house. All temples started as shrines, and from the shrine place, people build other edifices. Buildings have some historical or religious significance. Advantages of Patari. The ethical principles are more conducive to community, not so geared towards individualism. Some religions demonstrate their power by showing what they can build but that is only a matter of financial, not moral wealth. Are you more civilized because you can build a nuclear bomb? We must not be impressed by the things which can be created because we are human and have the same capacity and can create the same things out of our own minds. But our African gods do not advance destruction. They have never been gods of death, but of life. The material manifestations of religion are not the wisest standard of how good God is unless your God is money. The new religions seem to bring schools and hospitals but we have always had those institutions without calling them by those names. Now it is time that the practitioners of Ptari explain the interrelationship of the traditions of ordinary life in the context of institutions, our entire existence in religion, our shrines, our sacred places on sacred land given by the ancestors, our health is interconnected to our spirituality. We Africans have always believed in a supreme deity, whether the name was Nyame or Lotumari, Abasi, Unkulunkulu, Wayengi, Chuku, Mawu and Lisa. This is true, although others have said we did not. They have confused a lot of us. When the white missionaries translated the Bible in our languages, they asked our ancestors for the name of the Almighty, and they used the names our ancestors had always used for the Almighty, and then told us that we did not have the belief in the Supreme. But we now know that our priests were no less wise in their observations than the Greek sophists, the Hebrew prophets, the Arab ulema, or the Chinese literati. Our ancestors believed in pluralism without hierarchy, many expressions of God without saying mine is right or the only one and yours is bad, pagan and heathen. Perhaps had we done that, we would have stopped the alien religions at the shore, but we are the world's first humanists and we allowed others to come with their goods and their gods. They came with a political ideology in the name of religion. It was imperialism. Imperialism brings destruction, obliteration, how could we fall for it for so long? The introduction of a book or a gun caused us to lose our footing, to stumble on our way, to denounce our fathers and mothers. There are no other people on the earth who have had to denounce their ancestors in order to become better people. Is it because our ancestors are so strong that we are forced to denounce them before our conquerors? This is one thing you shall never find me doing because I know too much about my African contribution to history. Contributions of Tari, the first naming of the divine, Nature, God, or Necheru, divinity from which some say the English word nature is ultimately derived. The first trinity, Osa, Oset, Heru, which has been repeated by Amen, Mut, Konsu, and then God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Christians took out the mother who represented Oset and gave Christians a Virgin Mary, but she was no God. Asesa Ya is Mother Earth, but no one can have a son without a mother. The first idea of a son of God or a daughter of God, Sarah or Satra. The first black stone altars long before the Kaaba was revealed at Mecca. The first example of the resurrection from the dead, Osa. This is also where we find the Neb, Ankh, Lord of Life, was not a sarcophagus, that is, not a flesh eater, but something that spoke of life. The name of God, Amen, now used by others in their prayers. The idea that your good should outweigh your evil and that your soul should be lighter than a feather that perfection is not what is sought after, but overwhelming goodness. The complementarity of males and females, different roles but not subjugation. Mawu and Lisa, male and female, Oset and Osa, 
complementary tea. The first records of ancestors' wisdom, the books of Ptahotep, Kagemni, Duaf, the idea of heaven and earth, Nut, Geb, Oset is called Lady of Heaven. Here in Africa, humans have prayed to God longer than on any other continent. When the pyramids were finished, Europe had given the world not one organized civilization. Even Asia was just stirring. Just look at the broad chronology. 2500 BC, the African people along the river valleys of the Eastern Highlands floated stones down the Nile to help build monuments to God. 2500 BC, the Z dynasty rises in China. 2200 BC, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro were founded in India. 800 BC, Homer is the first voice of the Greeks. 500 BC, Romans come to power in Europe. 639 AD, Arabs are able to cross into Africa with force under General El As from Arabia, Yemen. Africans made the idea of the beautiful and the good one word, Nefer. Butare gave the world its first ethical system, Ma'at, balance, harmony, justice, righteousness, reciprocity, order. Ma'at was the only major deity without priesthood since all were priests of Ma'at. The idea of eternal life, Ank Nehe, was African. The first libations, offerings, and burning of incense as ritual forms. The Ten Commandments were preceded by the 42 confessions in the Egyptian Book of the Coming Forth by Day. Putari gave the idea of collective and communal salvation, rather than a rampant individualism which says, save me and the rest of the world go to hell. The future. All futures are made by human beings, but they begin with consciousness which precedes Afrocentrism. A few days ago, I walked into a Kumasi restaurant and I found that I could get Ghanaian food only by pre-arranged request. But Western food was immediately available, imported. Are African gods only on request? We determine this by how we live. The Wolof of Senegal say wood may remain in water for 10 years, but it will not become a crocodile. We live Africa by living its tried and true values and customs, and this is a credit to our gods. Almost all of the disarray in Africa can be traced to the disruption of the traditional religion. In fact, one can go from country to country and find that the cause of the problems can be laid at the feet of alien civilizations. This is not a wild statement. It is based on deep reflection and study. I believe in the African gods and believe that just as we have exported our cultural forms in music, art and science, the world needs a more sane and sensible ethic. What must be done? We must talk honestly to our elders, those who have not abandoned the tradition, consult the priests, learn from them and discover the source of our problems. Remove all images of a white Jesus. This is not correct even if one is Christian. The historical Jesus had to be black in color despite the missionaries' attempt to paint him English and Swedish. We must believe that our names are as sacred as Arabic or European names. We must understand that when others extend their values, religion and institutions they are penetrating our traditions with a poison of alien power that teaches us to hate ourselves and to love our oppressors. Meanwhile, they never follow the prescriptions they leave for us. We must enhance the economic, political and military power of African states because a lack of such power creates self-doubt, identity crisis and a search for the material gods of the West who seem to produce these things. But spirit is greater if we use it and we can only use it if we practice. We need boldness from our leaders to accomplish this transformation. Asians are calling for Confucianism as they emphasize tradition. The Japanese are calling for Nihon Jinron, Japanese values. Why must we be stuck with the attitudes and values of the European so-called Christian values, particularly since they have shown themselves to be bankrupt on many fronts? We can achieve our aims not so much by modernizing African traditions as Africanizing modernity itself. We are the modern people. Our ecological values, relationship values, respect for others' values are the keys to the future. Conclusion I recognize that humans cannot advance without answering some basic questions like who am I, why am I here, what is the purpose of existence, why are we as humans, Africans, Ghanaians, Gars, Ewe, Goans, Akans, African Americans. Religion provides compelling answers and often small communities of others who believe like we do. African deities and the almighty God of Africa do that for us. They give us identity and direction. We are the children of the supreme God sustained by our ancestral connections, formed to glorify the best values of Ma'at, encouraged to assume responsibility for each other in a community of consciousness. 
Failure to do this is a deviation, an abomination, and we can only reconnect through right and ablution, making, doing, or sacrificing time, money, energy in the name and interest of Africa. The concept of the gift is the idea, not what we give. This may change given education, science, sensibility, scarcity, etc. But we need to sacrifice for Africa. But our gods must not be one of exploitation, egocentrism, conservatism, and westernization. If so, we shall go to hell. We must create our African personality and identity in art, dance, medicine, education, science, and religion. And if we cannot do it here, in the land of Akumfo, Anoki, Nkrumah, and Du Bois, then it cannot be done in Africa. If we do not do it here, in the land of Ya Asantewa, then we can never be the hope of the hopeless. If Africa cannot find its way, then I fear the prospects of the world. But Africa will rise to throw off the vestiges of mental enslavement, and they shall be rejoicing among the Inananum in St. Manfo. The ancestors will say, Rejoice! Rejoice! Let the God of Africa rejoice! Thanks for watching this episode. Do remember to like, comment and subscribe and look out for the next one on Africa's great civilizations.